Hi, everybody. My name is Nick Meehan. I work here at Palo Alto Research Center. Um, how many people here are kind of familiar with what Park does today? OK. Uh, how many people are familiar with just Park in general? OK. Uh, so I'm glad I get most of the, the crowd here. Um, so Park today um, is a little bit than you know the kind of the storied park. Um, we uh, now are a wholly owned subsidiary of Xerox. Um, what that means is that allows us to do about a third of our research um, at, for commercial clients. So we, we have Fortune 500 companies who come to us with really interesting problems. And we have a, a whole bunch of researchers here who are really interested in helping them solve those problems. Um, we do a, a, about 30% of our work is, is government, um, 20 to 30. Um, and then uh, the other portion of it is, is, is our Xerox work. And so we've kind of got this broad set of problems that we get to solve, everything from healthcare um, to uh, AI. Actually, this section of the building just to my left is where the majority of the AI researchers work at Park. Um, and then downstairs, we've got you know semiconductor fabs and all sorts of other wonderful hardware laboratories that I really don't understand you know, a huge amount of the work that goes on down there. Uh, my colleague Slate works with a lot of those folks. Um, and I, I, you know, I want to set that off because um, you know, what I'm going to discuss is a process that we're working on. Um, and it's, a, it's an important process because it's helping us to try to like, answer and, and, and think through some of the difficult questions of where we are today. Um, which leads me to this slide here. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm not here to to pick on big companies. Uh, big companies tend to make all the headlines. Um, I, actually, frankly, I think if we're going to talk about some of the difficult things that can happen when you are really working with AI as a material. Um, I think it, it's it's the, the the lean fast startups that scare me a little bit more, um, where you have to make quick decisions, um, <clears throat> and it, you know it's these types of things um, that kind of got us to where uh, Park is today. Um, so. Who knows what a like an institutional review board is? Probably the majority of the people in this room. Um, so it, it just for context, um, an IRB. I'm actually going to flip back a slide here because my notes are better on this page. Um, <clears throat> is a body that oversees research involving human subjects. Um, the goal is to protect welfare. Um, rights, privacy uh, of human subjects. Power, it has power to approve research, um, require modifications to, um, in order to sort of secure approval, or to disprove human subject research. Um, IRBs have teeth. Um, I think we hope that someday the guidelines that we set up now may also have teeth. Right now, we're a committee. I mean, I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, the next question I want to ask is who, either in recent work or even in you know, the career, if we're going to really go far back, um, you know, has run into a problem where they wish they had an opportunity to think through an ethical conundrum in a technology or a product that they're working on. Like, just generally, like, you know, you had to kind of go, okay, I wish I had more time to think through this. I wish I had somebody to talk to about this. Um, that's the process that we're really trying to grow, is that there is an opportunity for those conversations. Um, so, you know, that's where I kind of get to introducing what the board is. It's where we aim to mitigate risks before they occur and prevent harm and advise project teams how to move forward. Um, and I'm going to kind of address how we do that. Um, I, I'm hoping in this conversation, especially since we're a small group, um, I can talk a little bit more about how that's different than um, just sort of laying out a guideline for ethics, you know, something that 
you show up your first day and it's like, okay, this is how we feel about AI and our research as a company. Um, and why it's important to have these conversations and make, and make it part of the process. Um, so yeah, Park has a long history in AI research. And so one of the questions is, is why, why now? And I, and I think, you know, really, it's that as AI plays a greater role, we need to take greater care and more responsibility. Um, we want to keep watch and avoid or at least minimize difficulties. And, and when they are difficult, address them. Um, you know, and really, it's to start to avoid these kinds of headlines as well. Um, risk management is a big part of it. And you know, if we're talking to our executive committee, that's part of the conversation. Is it's, it's a way to get funding is saying, hey, we're going to help you try to avoid risk um, by having these conversations. So within this, you know, there, there's several ethical considerations in AI. We are not addressing equipping AI with capabilities for moral decision making, um, economic effects of AI or robotics, um, malicious use of AI, uh, the existential threat to humanity. We are addressing AI, research, AI researchers' individual res personal responsibilities. And we're, we're addressing that because we think that addresses some of these questions as well. Um, but also because I, I think it's, it's important. Um, you know, and, and this is not to beat up on, on engineers or, or, yes? I could imagine there'd be another bullet that's addressing the institutional uh, responsibilities of AI. Is that possible or? Yeah, I, I see the AI researchers' individual personal responsibility, but they work inside of a framework. I think that's a really good question. And I think to some degree, the process we're working on would address some of that, because it's really about starting this before a project starts. Um, and so that you can actually think about, you know, can we use this data? This data? Should we be doing this project? Does this make sense? Um, because on, on the first four, yeah. I didn't see any research in there, only four in the first. Right. No, and I think that's that's a really relevant point. Um, in this instance, we're not necessarily trying to police other organizations. Where we are really, and we're not trying to police anybody. Actually, that's something we're very clear when we give our lab talks: is we're not here to tell you what not to do. Um, but I guess my answer is one: I don't have a have a direct answer for it. But the, the easiest answer is is we have support from our organization to be doing this work, and to make sure that they're aware of the risks. We've had several conversations directly with our CEO, and and we've kind of worked um, on having a lot of these dialogues. Um, uh, but I don't I don't have an, a simple answer to that. Um, So I mean, th this is some of this is going to come across as a little bit obvious, but um, AI research is being used in ways that affect people. Um, predictive analytics, decision making, and support tools, self-driving cars. Uh, the work that I've been doing a lot on is lately has has been robotics. That was originally where I was hoping to be able to talk about, and it's until I've published something, it's a little bit hard to actually have those conversations. Um, <clears throat> there's potential for harm and people unduly tr trust technology. Uh, we as AI researchers have a personal obligation to consider the consequences of our work. And that seems like something that should be obvious. Um, myself and my colleagues have had conversations with people who say, you know, uh, when, when asked about sort of ethical portions of, of someone's work, you know, this seems like there's potential for misuse. I, and the response has been, I'm going to leave that to the sociologists. 
Um, and, and that's really kind of where we're trying to address. And, uh, and not to beat up on, on, on engineers, I think there's a lot of amazing engineers, um, but it is, it has been part of um, that education system that, it, that there's not a lot of time to really take courses on ethics, to take courses on philosophy. My, my younger brother studied engineering at Brown and we just had this conversation, so I'm gonna throw it in here now and not to beat up on him, but um, he, he was actually disappointed that he couldn't take more poetry classes when he was in engineering school because he, he was like, I've got this very, very regimented set of courses that I have to get through. Um, you know, I got, he got, I think he took a course on American excep exceptionalism and um, experimental poetry and that was kind of the extent of his liberal arts education. Um, and, and that was disappointing for him. Um, but, you know, he, he's now doing his PhD in, in artificial intelligence down at San Diego. Um, and that's some of the things that we're trying to address. And, and it's probably one of the reasons that the three people who started this board, two designers, actually it was three designers, and um, an AI researcher who also previously had a liberal arts degree um, before going into um, computer science. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, on the topic of undoing trusting technology, uh, May 2016, a woman drove into Georgian Bay in Ontario. Um, she was following her GPS and drove into a lake. Um, it was to her credit, and she couldn't really see a lot, but instead of pulling over, it was like, you know what, I'm just going to trust the GPS that it, it's telling me the, you know, where, I'm, where I'm going. Um, uh, fatal faith in technology, you know, Joshua Brown died in a Tesla accident. I'll touch more on this one. Um, and in, in the public sector, um, you know, it's wholeheartedly adopted algorithmic decision making. Uh, for example, parole boards have been starting to use uh, AI or different models to be able to determine whether or not somebody can go on parole. Um, and uh, Brown, Ice, and Goodman in 2017 filed 42 open record requests, um, some of them to the companies that actually produced these models and the response they got back was it's a proprietary algorithm, we can't tell you how it made this decision. Um, so, you know, this is where I'm gonna get into the, kind of the nitty gritty of this and I'm really open to having conversations here and I'm actually hoping to have conversations here. Um, there's four practical considerations that we kind of have been going through as we develop this board or this committee. Um, you know, relevance of data and models, safeguards, accuracy, size and severity of impact. And these are kind of the, the areas we've decided to focus in, in this. We have, we have this ridiculous list. We went through several phases of kind of trying to simplify it and make it something that we can actually get through. Um, so, My colleague who, who it was one of the people who helped develop this talk tells this joke. Um, it's, it's about a man sort of intently searching for his keys under a lamppost. Um, a police officer sees him and helps him for a bit with no luck and finally asks, did you really lose your keys here? And the guy says, no, it was across the street, but the light's much better over here. Um, Often we're trying to find the equation that best matches the data we have, but it can be really hard to find equations that fit the data and can generalize when we use it on new samples. Um, what was the purpose in collecting the data in the first place? How did that inform the goals? And what does it mean for the data? Now that's like kind of getting a little bit into the weeds there, but it's really important. Um, and, you know, we have clients who come to us all the time with big data sets of we collected it for this, but we think we can use it for this over here. And a lot of the time the answer is, well, we're not sure that's going to work, but, but, you know, but they really want it to work. Um, and you know, th these are the kinds of questions that we have to kind of go through as, we, as we've developed this process. Um, so an example, uh, Google flu trends. Um, 2008, Google researchers had an idea, uh, kind of a great idea, that search queries related to the flu could indicate a spreading virus. 
um, thinking this could be valuable, a valuable tool for the CDC. First year, it seems to indicate a strong predictive signal, and you can kind of see it running through here. And, and you know, 2010, it, it's like spot on, big epidemic. You get to 2013, and they're like, okay, this is going to be a huge epidemic, and, and it's not the same. You know, online behavior may not really reflect the real world. Underlying search algorithms change. People's search behaviors can change. Probably not a good single indicator. Um, but these kinds of data sets can have impact. Um, another example, um, so there was a, some really interesting research that was being done on predicting probability of death um, in pneumonia patients. Uh, now, one of the things that the model ended up doing, they, they developed this really novel neural net that was orders of magnitude better than anything else that was being used. Um, and what it learned was that asthma patients were low risk. Now, that doesn't sound right. Now, the reason it learned that asthma patients were low risk is because as soon as somebody with asthma comes into a hospital, um, doctors go, okay, we're going to take extra care of this person. We're going to get them on drugs. We're going to make sure that they're getting all the care that they need. And so their scans tend to always get better. Now, what that taught the model was that asthma patients are low risk. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, input data does not necessarily reflect reality. Um, and, you know, th that's where we get to this. Well, it, it can be fixed once it's known, but, you know, what don't you know? And so it's those edge cases that are really the complex things that, you know, having these conversations become increasingly important. Um, and, you know, you should really understand the model. These, to, to use it safely. Um, the research team ultimately chose uh, a logistic regression model over the more accurate neural net for this reason. Um, and it, it was that it, they couldn't inspect it and really understand why the decision was made. Um, safeguards for failure is the next one. Um, we tend to highlight the positive results. What are the failure modes? What are the unintended consequences, misuse? You know, these have kind of been on the news over and over again, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, but um, in this case, I, I think at this time, computer assist mode was between levels two and three um, of autonomy, um, but only in the right conditions. Now, I, I'm really careful, and, and frequently if I'm, if I'm in a room with a bunch of computer scientists, they'll say, yeah, but it's, it's safer for the broad portion of the population you know, it, these cars are safer than other cars, and that's true. Um, but it doesn't mean that enough was done to educate on how to use this new technology. Um, and, I, and to some degree, you know, as a designer, I see that partially as one of, partially as my job. It's like, okay, how do I communicate what's actually happening? Why you shouldn't do it this way? What does this thing see? Um, in this case, the NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration um, in in investigation found that no defects in the car, um, the responsibility was, responsibility was totally on the driver. NTSB investigation determined otherwise, um, you know, and determined that Tesla was partially at fault because they didn't take these steps. Um, accuracy is a really kind of a key point here, and I don't have any examples for this, but. Um, how accurate is the model? Um, how accurate does it need to be? Are we sure? If a 1% failure negative, negatively impacts 1,000 people, is that acceptable? Um, you know, going back to the Tesla instance, edge cases. Um, edge cases are one of the hardest things to really handle, but they're, they're kind of the key to something working in these instances, especially when it's critical. Um, how does the accuracy on test data compare to real life data after it's deployed? Um, and is there a way to measure it over time? I and mean, these are the types of questions that when, as we work with our researchers, we're hoping to kind of help them think through. Um, and that's kind of where the process is really trying to, to kind of shine. Um, size and severity of the impact. How many people, how severe? What is the impact on society? Um, these ones are kind of 
obvious and, and you know that's where the, the measured response and how you actually go through the questioning you really have to kind of make sure that it matches what the potential impact of the tech what the of the potential impact of the technology um, so other thoughts on this is you know many personal characteristics are illegal for consideration when people make decisions about hiring um, judicial proceedings and job performance do our models exclude these um, what about correlated characteristics? Humans are really good at ignoring irrelevant attributes. M models, not so much. Um, often conception between accuracy and the intelligibility of a, mo um, of a model. Um, it's more predictive, but it's harder to understand models that can make it possible to know which characteristics determine a decision. Um, and, and ultimately, there's no opportunity to validate against human judgment. So this is where we get to the, the black box algorithm and really not being able to understand and w why actually the research that's, being, that's going on today about um, explainable AI is so important. <coughs> so now I'm going to get a little bit more to the mechanics of the committee, and I want to like, leave an opportunity for questions or discussion about some of these points that I've been talking about before I go forward. Um, anything? where when you realized there was a need and and how um, how you came together and, and how you worked with um, internal folks to say hey this is important and thank you yeah um, so right now we're we're two designers we started with three designers and now we're two designers and an NLP researcher and we've just been through this big round of lab talks um, and so we actually have a few more people who are going to be joining our um, Committee in the next month. We're really just kicking this off. Um, um, and then in the process, we've also had several collaborat collaborators, and I'll have a slide on who we've actually worked with externally to help develop this. Um, I, I think, you know, really it came out of um, a triple AI talk that one of my colleagues went to and said, you know, the conversations that they're having about ethics and AI are just not the conversations that are relevant to what we're actually doing. Um, it, was, it was a lot of the things that I outlined in the left column and not enough of, okay, what does that actually mean in my day to day when I actually have to address a client? Um, and I think that was the, the, the challenging part that, that brought this out. And um, I ended up reaching out to my boss who then said like, okay, well, let's just get in a room and start discussing it. And, and that's really where we started. Um, and, and some of the things that I'll address, like for example, in, in June, we're actually gonna have a workshop here. I think, I mean, actually maybe it'll be later in the summer. I, I don't know if the date's settled, but to, to actually help people start up their own <laughs> internal committees. And, and there's a several, several other things that we've put out to actually help with that process. Does that answer your question? Hi, uh, very interesting topic. Thank you for presenting. So when I, I hear about ethics and AI, I'm a, I'm a classic science fiction fan, so I think of Isaac Asimov and the three laws of robotics, right? Yeah. Um, and I know that's not what your c committee is, is doing, but, but I, I'm also a designer, and when I think about um, what's going on now and the lack of trust that most people have around AI and machine learning and that whole thing, I'm almost, you know, if I was a CEO of a company that was working in this area, which I'm not, I would think I'd almost want to be very clear. I, I think I would want to have guidelines associated with my brand that said, you know, whatever my core values were. Privacy would probably be one of those. You know, again, the Isaac Asimov one, you know, I will not harm a human being or through my inaction allow a human being to be, be hurt. And, and it, it would probably be different company to company. So if mm -hmm. I was at Google, you know, there might be a, a, a framework that I would want to publicize and institutionalize about what I was going to protect. On the other hand, if, if I'm uh, developing a, um, a police officer robot, right, which we're not too far away from, then 
you know, it would be really important for the public to know what are the ground rules that 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 this entity has to follow. Anyway, I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. Um, I think my thoughts on it. I mean, first of all, you know, move fast and break stuff. Um, you know, startup culture doesn't necessarily always meet that need. And so for large corporations, I think a lot of them are starting to really take it seriously. Uh, one, out of a sense of, of sort of civic duty. Uh, two, it's, it's risk. It, it's really risk. Um, Wait, when you say take it seriously, you mean uh, do some supervision over the AI? Do it, well, at least, yes, doing some supervision over the AI or at least setting guidelines out. You know, I'm not party to all of the kind of discussions that go on at Google or Facebook, or uh, although some of those Facebook discussions seem to have made it out into the public recently. Um, I, but I, I'm, I'm actually a little bit less concerned about the big companies and a little bit more concerned about everybody else. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that just comes from personal conversations that I've had with clients around these, these topics, around privacy, around other things is that, you know, when you're not leading, you're looking for any edge you can get. Um, and I think that's where creating a practice is important. We're recording, and so we need your voice on the recording. Uh, so I saw a note in LinkedIn saying that uh, uh, the uh, city of San Francisco airport has banned face recognition technology from being used. So, I mean, from a committee perspective, do you advise the uh, government or San Francisco, city of San Francisco in any sense? Do you collaborate with them in any sense? And no. what are your views from a committee perspective if you had to advise on things like that? Well, so, I mean, that's a difficult thing for me to answer because we haven't really sat down and understood like what process they made to make that decision. But my guess, and I haven't read the article. It showed up on my watcher like a couple hours ago, and I, I was practicing this talk. Um, <laughs> um, but to be honest, late breaking. Here we are. Yes, late really, you know, um, got to be on my toes on this one. Without having read the article, my guess is is that they probably didn't feel like they had the internal safeguards to actually be able to handle that tool and that data. Um, at least that's that would be the thing that I would say. Okay. Do we have the, the a way to actually evaluate whether or not this is being used ethically? And if we don't, then we don't use it. Would be probably my first instinct on that. You s you have more to go, right? Yes. So why don't you go ahead and do that, and then we'll open it up for some more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to try to skip through this part quickly and kind of get to like act, you know what some of this actually looks like. But um, the goals of the committee is you know it's reviewing projects within PARC as a preventative measure. Um, consult, train, and educate engineers, re researchers, designers, and the public about ethics and technology. Um, help teams assess risk and unexpected outcomes. Um, and it, you know, if incidents do occur, you know, actually try to understand why. Um, and then you know, this, this last one's really important. And it, you know, it's a difficult thing in, in technology companies. Um, you know, the committee has the additional goal of pursuing diversity, equity, and other means of inclusion within park research, within the park research community, as a way to identify and prevent inadvertent discrimination in our work. You know, if you don't have a diverse team working on it, it's hard to actually identify <laughs> problems. Um, you know, and that cuts across um, gender, race, socioeconomic, ec economic background. You you need diversity to really be able to understand the, the outcomes. Um, so what happens? Project gets greenlit. We've got this really simple checklist that we have people go through. Um, the principal investigator or the lead um, presents to the committee. We review the project, project kicks off, and then we iterate. Um, depending on whether or not we've determined it, you know, in some instances it's really simple. You know, okay, so it's Xerox. I'm going to use this example because it does not actually happen. But we've got this printer. People use it. 
should we talk to the committee? Well, is there a way that somebody can hurt themselves? Right, let's have a conversation. Let's talk about it for five minutes. What are you doing? Well, we have to go through this, this, and this check with you know, these different safety boards. Okay, we probably don't need to have a com that, that long of a conversation about it. Um, we've got other projects that have much deeper data sets that have you know, personally identifiable information in and other things that really needs a much deeper conversation and probably needs several checks along the way to understand how that research is developing. Um, and so, you know, it's about actually addressing it as it comes along. Um, so current board members are Kyle Dent, who's a co-chair, um, Rochelle Dumond, my colleague, who's also a co-chair, and I'm, I'm a member of the committee who's kind of been there since the beginning. Um, Mike Kunyowski was on the committee. He left Park, was it a week ago, two weeks ago? Um, two weeks ago, look into Slate over here. Um, and we've got a few members who, who will start joining us. And then we've got some external um, people who I'll mention later as well. Now, what we've done so far, and I'm gonna pull this up really quickly. Um, so this is super simple. We've actually got this also on our website and um, we're probably gonna have an internal tool. Let me just like fire this off really quickly. Really simple checklist. This first part's really just about how we handle the information coming in. Um, but as we get through it, you know, it's data considerations. Does the data represent individuals or populations of people? Does the data contain individual personal attributes? Is the goal to make predictions about people's behavior? Um, and if someone answers yes to any of these questions, we'll probably have a conversation. And it might just be an email. I mean, is there heavy equipment or is it operating at high speed? Well, printers operate at high speed, but they're, you know, the way they're designed today are probably pretty safe. Um, if the score gets higher, we probably have to have more conversations. Um, this is just a way that we get our project leads to kind of go through and just quickly evaluate, do I need to have this conversation? Um, and in some instances, the answer is no. And I, we're actually trying to refine, refine this so that we get the right number of no and yeses. Um, and that's where we are right now. Um, but it's a very simple tool. Um, and this is also going to be, um, it's on our website. We've, we document everything that we do. Um, we do it in GitHub um, because that's who we're speaking to. It's developers, it's AI researchers, um, and it keeps track of the changes that we're making and because we want to be transparent about the decisions we're making. Um, and we make it public or we made it public, it is still public. We made it blue, um, and we, we have a web link, and I'll, I can share this out as well. Um, and the entire process is online, it's all there, um, including that checklist. Now, we're personally very big believers in checklists. Um, you know, it works well in hospitals in preventing deaths. <laughs> um, we think it can also make some headway in, in AI research as well. Um, so what we've done so far, we, we've done actually a couple of um, dry runs, and this was the first dry run that we did where we actually had somebody come in who had already completed a project and we walked them through the process. And this is how we both learned how to, how, how to go through it ourselves, but also um, how to refine it. Um, this project, uh, Procter & Gamble came to Park and, and said, you know, we're trying to reach a younger audience and we want to put together an app and we have this idea of doing this, this skin advisor and we've got some really, really great computer vision engineers here. Um, and uh, what this app does is it, it can predict, and it's, it's online at skinadvisor.com, it can predict your skin age based on things that you can't see in an image. Um, and the model um, was put together by this huge number of um, photos that Procter & Gamble collected. Um, we published on this with them so I can talk about this. Um, and you know, as we walked through the project with, um, with the principal investigator, Matt Shreve, who we're really grateful could like sit down and, and give us feedback as we went through it, um, it, it became clear that, you know, hey, the researchers actually knew that there was bias in the model. They, they didn't actually have a, have a good sample for 
the market that they wanted to release it in. It was not um, representative of um, a predominantly, um, I think it was Asians, and it, it didn't work very well with African Americans, um, mostly because of the, the amount of light that was needed to really see what was going on on the skin. Um, that was communicated to some of their stakeholders, but they actually had no plan for how they would maintain it as it went on to different stakeholders within the company. That like, how, how are we communicating what that model can be used well for? Um, and, and those are the types of things that comes up. You, you, know, you hand off your code and you go, okay, we did it. And we, we told them, you know, it works well here and it kind of works well here, but it doesn't really work well over here. But what happens when that gets handed off to another team? How do you document that? How do you make sure that that information is shared on? And how do you make sure that's part of the process? Um, and you know, I, as a result of that conversation, we're like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to our contacts, and we're gonna make sure that we actually like make sure that we communicate clearly where the edge cases are for this model. Um, people generally want to do the right thing when they know. Um, we receive funding from AI Journal. Um, we'll actually have that was the, that's how we're funding our workshop that we're going to have here in a couple months to help people kick off their own committees or their own structures, and and we're hoping to kind of help people think through that process and what makes sense for your organization. This makes sense for us because we're a bunch of researchers. It may not make sense if you're a bunch of you know, product developers. It may be a different process. Um, we've written some papers. We presented here last week. Um, we're really trying to do a lot more community outreach. Um, you know, we hope to have more conversations with other people who are starting to create these different tools. Um, I think IDEO came out with a tool recently. Google came out with a really great guideline recently. This list is growing really quickly. Um, and um, I think some of them are really well thought through. Some of them um, have some room. Um, and you know, we're also trying to understand like how this fits within this vi um, environment, like both park and you know, within communities like this one. Is, you know, it's not about merely having a set of guidelines. Um, it's you know, how, how do we m maneuver ethical dilemmas together? And how do we create more involvement um, so that we have more viewpoints. Um, so next steps for us is you know test cases. We have to do more of them. Um, we've got actually connections with professors in the field. Um, Molly Wright Steenson has been really helpful. Uh, she's a, prof a new professor of ethics and computational technologies at Carnegie Mellon. Um, Vincent Conitzer has been um, very helpful, and uh, David Danks helped us put together our checklist, and so we really have tried to reach out to other people. Um, and uh, we've tried to participate in AI ethics conferences and establish park presence in the space. Um, so final thoughts, go rogue. You know, the question about how do you do it, it's you just do it. Um, and yes, you can do this too. Um, and we'll help. So if you want to reach out to us, please, um, you know, I can post this link later. Um, you know, there's actually a, if you go through our form and you say you're not a park employee, it just directs you back to a thing that says, okay, email us. <laughs> we'll have a conversation. Our, our hope is that maybe we can actually make it something that we can do with external entities at a certain point as well. Um, thank you. Thank you. More questions? Hi, thank, thanks for that. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, give an example of what you mean by ethical dilemma, because I think that that's really what feels interesting. You mentioned ethical dilemma on one of your slides as, as something to, to wrestle with. The, um, the skin advisor example you used, um, it seemed to me that that is a, uh, a partially a, a data problem more than a computational problem. You know, like the data set, there was something flawed with the data set over the way that that was collected. Mm -hmm. And that was like a, a human bias problem, right? Like the humans didn't um, p 
populate the, the data set in a way that would be sufficiently diverse. Um, but it wasn't necessarily, at least to me, like it didn't seem like it was necessarily an AI problem. Like given the data that it had, that's the best it would be able to do, right? But like, w like an ethical dilemma seems like that would be a more complicated thing. Like, you know, do you, you know, do you hit the grandmother in the crosswalk or do you hit the, the you know, the, the bus of kids on the, on, the, on the sidewalk, right? Like that kind of ethical dilemma. How do you, how do you address those kind of questions in the context of a committee, um, especially if you're not sure like what will actually happen based on you know the computational output of a, of a system. So I think actually both of these are the, are similar dilemmas. One is your data is never going to be good enough. Right. Um, <laughs> I, there's a huge amount of data that was collected. I think a bunch of it had to be collected using twins. It, it's really hard to actually ever get enough data to really capture all of the edge cases. Um, if you listen to Andre Carpathy talk about self-driving cars and why it's difficult, it's because there's a lot of edge cases. <laughs> um, and people are, are generally good at catching those edge cases and kind of going, okay, that's a little bit outside of the norm, but I'm gonna, I, I kind of know what the right thing to do is here. Um, I, I, I mean, well, I mean, I'll push back a little bit on that. I have a, a designer colleague, and he's like, you know, if you're, if you're black, like the um, the automatic soap dispensers never work because <laughs> they don't see your skin, you know, or the the, the, the towel dispensers in the in the restroom. That seems like a pretty obvious. Uh, I wouldn't even call that an edge case, right? That, that I think that's like a primary sort of thing. So I think like that sort of stuff happens a lot. You know, um, yeah, and that's not yeah. an edge case. Yeah, uh, I think that's a absolutely true. So is that a data problem or is that a design problem? I don't know. Or is it the fact that we didn't we set the we set the the boundary at this level? An ethical dilemma. <laughs> um, we can't get the whole bandwidth because you know it's then it's going to trigger on the floor. <laughs> really though? I mean, I, I think that's the, those are the questions though. It, it, you know. <laughs> you mind if I jump in? Um, I wonder, it's maybe not an ethical dilemma, but rather it's a, um, does the company want to be seen as somebody who doesn't care about black people or doesn't care if certain people are impacted where other people are not? It's not really an ethical dilemma, but it's a, it's, it's a dilemma that says, hey, the values of this company doesn't match what um, the rest of society might expect it to match. And that's the dilemma. It's a business dilemma, perhaps, but maybe not a mechanical one or an ethical one, but rather start solving the wrong problem or, or not caring about a certain population because you've externalized your, your costs. I, I <laughs> I'm just curious, actually, on the follow-up on that, uh -huh. um, what they, if you're able to share with us any decisions they made or they didn't make about that issue with their technology or their app? Um, uh, one decision is that it doesn't predict people's age anymore. Um, it, it gives a kind of generic score, partially because they found that it, it really hurt people in some instances. Um, um, I think the other thing is is that they're working on, on really trying to figure out the user experience case for, I'm going to stand a little bit further away from that mic, I guess I can hear a little bit. Um, they're trying to figure out the, the, the user experience, you know, when it can't recognize your face, for example. Like, how do you handle that? You can't just keep saying that, like, you know, you need more. Try money. again. Um, and so uh, I think it, it's, it's saying, you know, that's a feature we need to emphasize here. Now, on the point of, of it's up to the company, I think, m at least this is my, maybe this is my personal bias here. Most of the time, when presented with the dilemma, people want to do the right thing. I think if you don't have the process to actually try to understand <laughs> that there is a problem, it, it just never comes up in the first place. Um, I mean, yeah. I, you know, without the characterization of all engineers, right? Hashtag right. Hashtag all engineers. But uh, uh, if you take the expression that Nick was sharing with us, well, Let's leave that to the sociologist. That's the suggestion that there is a role that's going to handle it, and I don't have to think about it. 
and I think all the, the, the as far as you've gotten so far as to say yes, every I has to think about it. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Or at least m you know make sure that they take the step to have somebody walk them through the process. <laughs> Um, you know, and eventually maybe we don't have to have everybody think through. I, I, and a lot of engineering programs are starting to have mandatory ethics um, courses, although I, I question whether or not one class is really going to get you where you need to go. I, it, I had exactly this opportunity a week ago today where there was a social gathering and I met this woman who's a professor at uh, San Francisco State and she said, oh, we're teaching the machine language AI course to this group of students. And I said, and you've got a component in there about ethics, right? This is before I even knew that this was the topic you were coming with. And she said, oh, I hadn't thought about that. I'm sure somebody else is covering that. <laughs> I said, well, just maybe think about one module because then it'll communicate to the students that it's important. It's important enough for one module. Gail. Okay, follow, follow me on this thread here. What, what is ethics? How would you define ethics? I mean, say, ethical dilemma versus, say, a value dilemma, uh -huh. right? This is, a value dilemma means, okay, that's not what we want to do, we want to do this other thing. Right. Is ethical dilemma kind of like the same thing, except it's assumed to be there's a universal set of values that everyone agrees with, and that the role of ethics is to tell you whether you're going contrary to that universal set of values or not. So, oh, and then there's the law. Oh, there. So there's a second module on the law, no right? Law. Except there's no law. So, I, I, uh, two parts to that question. Um, w w that was something that came up when we were working through the <coughs> committee, and I, I'm not sure I have the best answer for it. And I, it is complicated because depending on the country that you're working in, the values can be very different. Um, I think we decided that as we address these problems, we are going to work within the values of the company that we were working that, that we are working in, um, and make sure we communicate from those values because those are values we actually understand, um, and do our best to at least address from the standpoint of who our client is, and make sure that we ed educate them and try to understand their viewpoint if there is a, a counter viewpoint. But you know. If something doesn't align with our values and we genuinely think it's wrong, then you know that's where we have to kind of go from on that point. Um, uh, on and, and I, there's room for fault on in, in a couple of different directions there, and and so I, I, it's a little shaky. Um, on the other point of the law. Um, Yes, there are legal considerations. Um, everybody who is on our board, and I still actually have to kind of do another module on this, has to go through um, IRB training. Um, we just have to go through the process. We don't actually have to get completely certified, or we don't have to join the IRB, but we have to go through the training process. Um, in addition to that, you know, I think there's places that the law doesn't also that doesn't address everything. Either, um, you know, I, there's a recent, uh, recent like in the last ten years, a, a case on um, strip searches. Um, the su Supreme Court decided that it was legal for police to um, do strip searches. Uh, insurance agents said, "No, we're not going to cover you if you do strip searches." They just decided that's. We don't necessarily think we don't necessarily agree with it from a value standpoint. We also don't think it's a good idea from a from an insurance standpoint. Um, you know, there's ways that you can also just sort of say, okay, well, where we fill the gap where the laws don't um, meet. And the U.S. is woefully behind the EU in a lot of respects on that. Um, and so that, that's why it's important to kind of do a little bit of you know what you can now. Uh, I don't know if anybody else saw this flash past your screen in the last couple of days. IDEO has just come out with a set of AI uh, ethics tools or uh, guidelines or principles, I guess is what they call it. And they've created a, a lovely deck of cards, 10 cards or 20 cards, whatever it is. <laughs> and they have activities for teams to do to draw the, you know, to consider these questions. 
So I think it'll be fun for you to look for that. I think that's interesting. I'm, I'm do you want to do you want to pull up the page? I can. Yeah, I can pull up the page. Uh, I'm I'm very curious. I have not seen this tool yet. Yeah, I just glanced through it really fast because I just saw it today. How timely! Just a second. Let's see if I can just switch over my browser. Their blog, and it and it should be the same too. Ido.com slash blog slash. Let's see what happens when we get there. The octopus. Okay. And here it is. It's the latest. AI needs an ethical company. That one. Okay. Where should I scroll to? There's a there's a big block coming up that's got the principles. Is it this? A little bit, little bit beyond there. Here we come. Okay, data is not truth, okay. Don't presume the desirability of AI. Respect privacy and the collective good. And unintended consequences of AI are opportunities for design. I think that's a good point. Um. Anyway, then right there, uh, sorry, uh, if you go down just slightly further and it says here underlined, whoops, above Oveta, above Michael and Oveta, in the last couple, oh, stop, in the text here is underlined. Oh, they got their card. That gets you to the card. You have to put in your email address and it'll let you download them. Anyway. Oh, now I can get some IDEO consulting with my cards. Exactly. Um. <laughs> I think it's I think it's interesting, and I think there was one point there um, about the desirability of AI that I think is is an important conversation to have. Um, you know, I, Park as a technology company that has external clients coming to them regularly. Um, it's a question I'm not sure happens. It's, it's a conversation that I'm not sure happens often enough. Um, but I think that's probably true of a lot of companies. And then I, there's a lot of things that I think are called AI that are not necessarily AI or in the predictive sense. Um, I, I really want to try these cards. It Main seems like it's sense. always the design solution is a, is a deck of cards. <laughs> Other questions? Other comments and opinions? All right, Satosh. So have you had uh, cases where uh, organizations have come to you and you have found that it's probably not the right thing to do and you have kind of declined saying, advising them, say, it's probably bordering on things that you wouldn't want to do and probably... Um, yeah. I've had conversations with VPs of companies about privacy in particular, um, and I, you know, I think, especially with when you're working with um, people who are in industries that are going through a lot of um, upset, which is almost anybody, because Amazon really upsets a lot of industries right now. Um, <laughs> I there's a there's a sense that that consumers don't always care about their privacy if they're getting something for free. Um, and I, I think generally the response that I, you know, that I have is, especially if I'm talking to a business person, is that you don't want the risk of having that information if you don't need it. Um, uh, and that's stepping out of the ethics shoe and into the <laughs> actuarial shoe. But it's a way to communicate it, and then you can get into the ethical portion of you know why that also matters. Yeah. Um, I, I, on take uh, the follow on that, uh, I'm wondering if you find that uh, when speaking to business people, that speaking the language of business, basically money, is the, a great motivator compared to say, um, well actually, does that. What are your thoughts about how what motivates different groups within different companies um, to do pr 
perhaps think about these things and quote unquote do the right thing or do the thing that they kind of what, where they end up? Um, I think that's a tricky, it's always a tricky discussion to have. I think it's always worth at least making the point. It's also always, from my standpoint, as a, somebody who was trained in communication design, is always to put on the hat of how do I communicate this effectively to the person that I'm talking to? And if that means that we're gonna talk about it from a standpoint of, okay, this is why values matter and this is how, how it matters to your bottom line, or if it's, this is why values matters and this is how it aligns to your company's <laughs> goals, um, I, I think that's a conversation that you kind of always have to make sure that you have in the right, at the right time and in the right tone, but it's never an easy conversation. Does that answer your question? Well, I say let's mix it up ourselves. Thank you so much, Nick. And uh, come back next time, talk about robots.